I'm John Toole. If I haven't met you already, Executive Director and CEO of the Computer Museum History Center, I want to welcome everyone here uh, for, for really an exciting evening. Uh, just to give you a couple of minutes of, of who we are, um, we are certainly an organization that is really dedicated to preserving the artifacts and stories of the information age. And each and every one of you are part of that. And many of you that look around the audience today, I'm really in awe that uh, you've been helpful, so helpful with us. And we hope we will continue as we look forward to the next three to five years to really build a permanent home as part of the NASA Research Park on their 220 acres. So as you join us in the reception afterwards, you can visualize uh, a new building in three to five years, plus a very important cyber presence. Uh, we have a large number of functions being planned and put th together. As you know, this weekend is the Vintage Computer Festival that probably all of you will be attending and, and, and going to. Uh, uh, the, on October 11th, we have an interesting twist, which we call our History in the Making Lecture. It's going to be the fifth wave cartoonist, uh, Rich Tennant. It's how he looks at computer history. So a cartoonist view of computer history will give us perhaps a little different insight than we'd ever expected. Um, we have a special thing that hasn't been announced yet. Uh, Tony Sale will be here on October 21st. He'll provide a lecture here in the auditorium. That'll be on a Saturday at 4 p.m. Uh, there'll be more on that coming out very, very shortly. And he's going to talk on some of his Colossus uh, reconstruction and basically reconstructions in general. Uh, as you know, the 1620 team and Dave Babcock, I see he and many of the team here are also here that I hope you'll pick his mind uh, as we go forward this evening. Uh, on November 8th, we have uh, Fran Allen here and is going to talk about the Stretch Harvest compiler and the work that she has done uh, at IBM. And of course, our, our major event the following day is our Fellows Awards. I hope all of you can join us. And I might also point out that we will be having some member-only events, some exciting events coming up very shortly that will be announced. So um, if, if I may, uh, if you're not a member of, of the Computer Museum History Center and would like to become so, uh, please uh, get in touch with any of the staff and they'd be more than happy to help, help you uh, do that. It's my really fine pleasure to kick off this history lecture series uh, with Dick Grimsdale, um, who comes from the University of Sussex. But his uh, fame certainly is when he was at the University of Manchester and many, many things. In fact, the more that I have, have gotten to know Dick in the last 24, 48 hours, um, his charming personality, his technical insight, and the manner in which he really has approached problems over the years is, is quite astounding. And I'm just going to share that with us this evening. Of course, the one item that I think many of us uh, have, have known Dick about, if you will, is, is really how he used point contact transistors in the development of the transistor computer. And certainly, it is uh, reported to be the first transistor computer ever in the world. Um, I hate to use first, as Dag will always recommend to me. But on the other hand, I think he can tell us the story of, of how that came to be. Uh, he also has some wonderful, wonderful stories of his interactions with people, oh, little people like Alan Turing, Tom Kilburn, and many, many other folks from, from, uh, from England. And I think he has a, a wonderful story to tell, and, and he's a wonderful person. Dick, let me, let's welcome Dick Grimsdale for us to see him. Thank you, Dick. Thanks very much, John. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm starting my story in 1950 when I uh, graduated in electrical engineering at uh, Manchester University and uh, somehow or other I thought I might like to do research and uh, there was a possibility I might have worked on server mechanisms but then there was a lot of activity going on computers so I managed to uh, choose computers, it was all very chancy but I chose to work with computers and uh, Tom Kilburn kindly took me on and Tom sort of, within a sort of few days, he decided what he was going to do with me, uh, at least to start off with. So he sent me to Cambridge uh, to, uh, I think, the first summer school on programming uh, in uh, September 1950. And I wrote my first program for the EDSAC uh, 1, and uh, that was on my 21st birthday. So um, that's, that's, uh, how it started. So my, my job for my master's degree was to write uh, 
Um, uh oh, the technology has already gone wrong. Was to, to write uh, programs for the, uh, the Manchester Mark I, sorry, the Franti Mark I computer, uh, which was the uh, commercial version of the uh, um, uh, Manchester Mark I. This was inaugurated in July 1951. Uh, but I was writing programs before then. Uh, the, the, these, uh, the, the test programs, um, well, w when they brought the machine to the university, it wasn't finished, uh, and they were still working on it at the university, and it had lots of errors, lots of wiring errors, and the, the test programs, they used to say they learnt, the machine learnt the test programs because it kept on getting better and better as the engineers fixed the, the errors. Um, uh, notice the uh, notice the air conditioning at the at the top. Uh, uh, Four thousand. Um, be careful. I'm going to say valves, but vacuum tubes. Um, they're about um, three to one pentos to diodes. And uh, he here is uh, uh, the the, the uh, valve predominantly used the EF50. Uh, this is an all glass valve um, made, I think, originally by Philips, uh, but this one's Sylvania, in fact, uh, and it's got an Air Ministry label. So um, th that was, we'll see a bit more in a moment. It used the cathode ray tube store, uh, and this is the Williams tube, uh, and the, the, uh, you can see, see uh, a Williams tube here. Um, you can see also the size of the tube. It's six inches screen tube. You can get the idea of the length of the tube. And uh, th there's a, a metal plate that comes up the front which uh, uh, uses uh, elect electrostatic, uh, um, uh, like a capacitor effectively, w w with the screen. But I haven't time to talk about the, the cathode ray tube store today. That's, that's another story. Uh, looking again at the machine, uh, had hinge doors, and you can see the, the, the valves. Uh, Ted Hodg Hodgkiss in the front, one of the uh, maintenance engineers, and myself in the background. And um, so we now move on to the transistor. Now, apparently, there was a, a patent taken out in 1926, but I, I haven't found this. Uh, and also, I, I did find some diagrams of experiments on um, controlling the current in a crystal and cat's whisker. Um, the, the, the crystals, of course, were, were polycrystalline. polycrystalline. Uh, probably a whole variety of different substances were used. Gelina was one. Um, I've got a book at home with, with about a hundred of these different crystal types listed. Uh, and uh, what they did was to have a, a little metal plate not, not in contact anywhere, but near the, the point contact, and they, they found they could control the current in, in, this, uh, in this junction. Um, so I guess that's the first field effect transistor. I, I have to f got to find that. Um, uh, here we are, the, the paper uh, in uh, BSDJ. Um, I'm sure that's BSDJ. This is Bardeen and Bratain. And it's June uh, the 25th, 1948, announcing the point contact transistor. And uh, you see the, the diagram at the, at the bottom. And uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit more of the... So um, he, here is the, um, uh, the, the, the actual transistor that I use predominantly made by STC, uh, made in a kind of tiny village in the southwest of, of England, a place called Ilminster, a very small place. Why they, they made them there, I don't know. Um, so um, let, let's... Uh, so you can uh, just see one of those beneath my finger but how we'll get it afterwards. 
Uh, let's uh, go inside. Yeah. Um, so he here we have the, the construction. Um, I'm a bit scared to use the, the mouse because it uh, tends to jump the slides a bit. But at the bottom, uh, you, you, you see a, a mass of black and, and then the germanium, the germanium wafer, uh, a single crystal of n-type germanium uh, and the, the two um, points um, located um, according to Bratain um, not more than 25 thou um, apart uh, and then some kind of jelly and those insulating sleeves went into the jelly lower down. Um, on the left shall we say is the emitter, on the right shall we say is the collector, those are the two points and the germanium wafer is the base of the transistor. Um, I'm going back to the uh, Mark I computer. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, one important thing they had to do to make the, um, the transistor was to form it. So a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, I go with the word condenser, we didn't know the word capacitor in those days, um, so, so um, we, we, they were called condensers, um, charged to uh, about 20 volts or up to even up to 50 and it's a rather brutal sort of process. You just discharge this uh, across the uh, um, collector point and the germanium base. Um, we never knew, I don't think anyone knew how it really worked, uh, um, not, not even the original authors I don't think. But it was later thought to be a multiple junction, a PN-PN junction was formed I I around, the, around that point. But we're never quite sure. Um, going back to the, the Mark I, there's actually Di, Di Edwards there. And um, what I wanted to point out was that, um, um, let's see if I can make this work. Yeah, there, there's one, one EF50 and there's another. The, these are the two sides of a flip-flop. Oh, it's gone. Um, these were two sides of the flip-flop and, and the larger tubes, the EF55s, were cathode follower amplifiers. So to make one two-state device, you had those four tubes. Uh, these were 6.3 volt, 0.3 amp heater, uh, the black ones, uh, which were covered with a, um, a dull, black, dull black to radiate the power. Um, I think they're 6.3 volt, um, about 1.5 amp heater, quite, quite a lot of, uh, and of course the, they run on 300, 300 volts uh, on, the, on the, the anode and minus 150 on the, uh, the collector, collector feed. So. Um, quite a lot of power in, in, in the, in the flip-flop. Um, here's a picture of F.C. Williams, uh, Sir Frederick Williams, um, uh, incredible genius, of course the Williams tube, but he did some very great pioneering work in the war. He, he, he was a, a really great, great personality, a very, very nice man, but extremely sharp and very fast thinking. Um, he devised a circuit using a, a tube uh, like, like this, um, which was a single um, one-valve two-state device, which called a Fantastrom. And someone came up to me, to, someone came up to him one day, uh, Professor Williams, um, could you tell me the origin of the word Fantastrom? Is, is it from the Latin or from the Greek? No, it, he said, it's just fantastic. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then there was a sanitron, and, and that was a sanitary fantastron. <laughs> so, um, we, 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 um, F.C. Williams did some very interesting work on transistor circuits, uh, and uh, I was indebted to him for, for the, the ideas of the circuits I used. Now, we start to get technical here for a few minutes. Um, now, with, with the junction transistor, um, I, I've, I've started off by 
uh, using some arbitrary units of current. Uh, and essentially with, with a junction transistor you put 100 units into the emitter uh, and you get 98 out of the collector. So the alpha current gain, the ratio of collector current to emitter current, was about 0.98 and the difference was two units out of the base current. The point contact transistor, however, had this negative resistance characteristic and you put one milliamp into the emitter and you got maybe about uh, three milliamps out of the collector anything between two and four uh, they were very variable in characteristic and of course the extra current had to come somewhere so it came um, uh, in, in um, it went into the base so one one milliamp went into the emitter two milliamps went in from the base and three came out of the collector so we now have a look at the basic circuit diagram used very widely in the computer. Uh, on the left is a, a three input AND gate with a, a level shifting network and if we just ignore that for the moment um, and pretend it's not there, if we look at the off condition of the transistor there was in fact a very small leakage current flowing in, in, in the transistor and um, so current flew, uh, f f uh, flowed from the, um, again I'm very scared at touching this because it, it uh, flips onto the next slide. Now it's gone, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, it, it came from, from the diode, from, from earth, uh, from the diode, into the emitter uh, and um, the um, the base of the off state was held above ground. Uh, the little bit of current in the transistor managed to hold the emitter at about ground, so the base was held above the emitter and the transistor was off. And there was still a little bit of leakage in the collector, so uh, that was pulled down and held at minus 12. Like oh, great, great, thanks very much. So here, the, the small amount of current is flowing down here. Uh, that point is at about, uh, with the germanium diodes, the voltage drop is only 0.1 of a volt across the germanium diode. So, so that was about minus 0.1 of a volt. Um, and uh, uh, this small leakage current here, but essentially uh, there was sufficient pull here to hold that down at minus 12, so that, that was off and of course the base was held up above earth. Right, if you raise all these uh, three um, uh, uh, elect uh, these three diodes, um, F.C. Williams uh, uh, said an AND gate is like the Labour government, it holds everyone down to its lowest level. <laughs> so, we, we take them all up and this goes above ground, the base, sorry, the emitter becomes positive with respect to the base, the emitter base junction turns on, current starts to flow in the transistor, a little bit of current flows there, more current flows in the base to get the extra current in the collector. So this causes current to flow here, pulling this point down. So up goes the emitter, down goes the base and you turn on the transistor very hard and it ends up in the on state with the emitter at just below zero, the collector just a little bit below uh, and uh, this point being almost up to ground. And then you turn it off with the, the clock waveform. Take it up the clock waveform, restore it to the off state. So that was the basic operation. Okay, well that's what it's supposed to do, but um, what, what uh, happened in reality. So we, we have the, the turn on here raising the, this is a test circuit, the, the emitter is taken up at this, at this point and um, we, uh, we, we hope the, the transistor goes on. So there's a little turn on delay 
Notice the time scale, four microseconds. A little time delay, and, and then uh, here the clock waveform uh, turns the transistor off. But the transistor doesn't go off right away. The charge carriers, these holes, remain in the base collector region for some little time. So it took some time to get the transistor off. Now, these speeds of operation here, this turn on time and the turn off time, predominantly decided to use this clock of the 8 microsecond period, 125 kilo kilohertz, or 125 uh, kilocycles per second, as we use those days. Uh, and we, we, we had to limit it to this typical speed, uh, allowing for this turn off time. That was fine if you had a nice transistor, but some were very pathetic. Uh, took all this time to get on, and then by the time they got on, it was time to go off. So th that was really a very poor uh, transistor. If they, the, if they didn't go off, you needed more base current. If they didn't go on fast enough, you needed more emitter current in the circuit. And here we, we have some tests. Uh, here were, were the batches. I received. So about 60 in the first batch, nearly 100 in the second, and so on, uh, as time went on. These were total rejects. Uh, these required a large amount of base current to, to make them go off, and these required a large amount of emitter current to, to make them come on. So it uh, wasn't a very happy prospect at trying to make a, a computer uh, with these uh, transistors. Uh, they, they first became available to me uh, early in 1953, in sufficient quantity uh, to uh, build a machine. I was about to make a so-called small valve machine, um, but they came along and um, so that's what we did. Well, the transistors were fine, but what did one do about the memory? Uh, one, one could have uh, made use of the, the cathode ray tube store, um, but, but that seemed to be somewhat uh, unethical or, or something. Uh, it uh, required thousands of volts uh, uh, on the uh, anode, uh, and of course the, the waveform voltages were about 70 volt swing or something like that, so it just didn't seem to be on, but quite apart from the fact they didn't have any they could let me have. Um, anyway, um, discussed this with Tom, and we found a, a rather uh, decrepit magnetic drum, or magnetic, magnetic, magnetic wheel. Uh, we, we've got this one here, that's, a, that's one from English Electric, that's a very nice one, uh, highly engineered, uh, if you've not seen it already, uh, but um, uh, this one was about uh, 11 and a half inches diameter, uh, about uh, two and a half inches high, and uh, d driven by an induction motor, notionally driving, going at 3,000 revs per minute, but of course with a slip it ran a bit slower and it was in bronze and it was nickel plated. Uh, this one here, this juice one, is, is a magnetic oxide. Um, the, the advantage of um, nickel plating was this, that the, the heads had to be very close to the surface of the drum and uh, the eccentricity, this was made by Ferranti and it was an uh, engineering feat with very special bearings to get an eccentricity of about a thou, one, between one thou and two thou. And of course you could see this eccentricity with the, um, the amplitude of the signal going up and down as the went, drum went down, or went, went round. Um, the, the, the heads were single turn heads, um, quite, quite small, um, ab about three eighths of an inch by one eighth of an inch, beautiful to use these, in, these uh, inches now, uh, um, the, the, the uh, uh, brass with a little bit of mu metal uh, 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 and a small single turn, and they had a uh, transformer coupling, and uh, this was the origin of the Manchester code, Manchester coding. Uh, someone asked about this recently, where did Manchester coding come from? And that was used because of transformer coupling, and that's a balanced waveform. It's got no DC component. It's also self-clocking. So um, I, I reckon F.C. Williams invented that. I'm not sure he came up with that idea. So um, the 
um, the memory was to be the drum and the registers were, were to be regenerative tracks or, or sometimes, I think known here as revolvers. Um, the IBM 650, did they use these? I have no idea. That was a drum machine. Um, a, 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 a right amplifier wrote onto the head about half an inch later, picked off the signal and it fed back. So the, the, the digits went round and round and round and we had 48 bits in, in about half, half an inch. 3,072 uh, digits around, around uh, the, the drum. Uh, I must say we, we did have to use valve amplifiers uh, most of the time. We did build transistor read amplifiers and write amplifiers but they were very unstable and we couldn't keep them going uh, really long enough. But we, 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 we did have these, uh, trans it was possible to make amplifiers with transistors but their highly regenerative characteristic made them quite difficult to tame when you're trying to get high gains and particularly we don't quite know what the, the gain, the open loop gain, was going to be. Um, right, the, the prototype machine, uh, this is the first machine, uh, and um, one or two features about this, the fundamental waveforms were derived from tracks on the drum. So it was a clock track, and that had 300, sorry, 3,072 pulses around the uh, circumference. I did put a, 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 a simple speed control on the drum. It wasn't really necessary, but I, I, I thought it'd be rather fun to have speed control. Um, so I put speed control on the drum. Um, now, in order to get the clock track written, um, w was a, a, a feat of endurance. I used to do it at night when waveform, when the power supply is the mains was fairly stable and so on. Um, with the drum stationary discharged the capacitor on, on one of the heads and put a mark. Bought the, bought, bought the, um, um, uh, the drum up, up to full speed uh, and, and then with an oscilloscope used a, uh, a manual phase lock loop technique to stabilize the, uh, to, to lock the uh, uh, wave for, uh, the time base. So I think it div probably divided by 16. So it wrote 16 pulses per rev and then got to 64 and so on, steadily down to get to 3072. The trick was not to leave any gap or, or and make sure they actually overlapped uh, exactly. Uh, and, and that was in so sort of one part in three, um, 10,000 or something, you know, very, very, very more than that. So, so the accuracy was pretty phenomenal. There was an address track here, so that, that uh, identified the a position of the 64 words around the track. Uh, the, we, we didn't know about bytes in those days. Um, we used words. The Manchester uh, computer, the Franti, had a 40-bit word. Um, I didn't think we even used bits, it was binary digits. Um, I, I had 48, which divide up into four syllables, uh, and uh, uh, the, the actual uh, computer word was 48 bits, the other bits were spare to allow switching time. Um, a 44 bit word seemed to be generous enough to me. Um, uh, it was all fixed point in those days but uh, th this gave uh, lo lots, of, lots of accuracy. You, you divide by log E or something, I don't know, to get to, no, log 10 to the, it's about, you divide by 2.3 I think to convert to um, um, no, some log two, obviously, to, to, to get to decimal. So it's about 13, uh, 13 or 14 decimal digits. Uh, this was the uh, accumulator unit, the, the main register of the machine with its ar arithmetic unit, uh, the main tracks here, and uh, the um, all, all, these, all these gates were individually controlled by bits in the instruction. Uh, and, and Tom thought this was rather clever, and I thought it was rather clever too, and he thought I'd invented microcoding. But I think really the credit goes to M.V. Wilts for that. Um, but it was a different form of micro, a very, form of, very crude form of microcoding. So there's no decoder. 
One bit in the instruction controlled the add, what one controlled this gate and that gate and so on. Um, and um, here, this is the, the, the uh, control register. So here we, we uh, uh, detect, we stored the current instruction and compared uh, the address with the address required in the current instruction. It's a three address code machine, uh, as typical with drum machines. Uh, the source and destination registers, uh, which also the destination and the source could either be uh, a, a location on the main store or accumulator register and later on the full, full scale machine or B register. Um, and uh, one address for the location of the next instruction. So the clever thing was to place the instructions around the drum, working out how long it took for an instruction to take place uh, and try to get another instruction on the, on the drum, on, on, on the rev. Um, so it worked at the speed of the machine. And of course, if it didn't have a speed control, uh, with the mains varying in those days, on a good day it went faster, bad day it went slower. Um, so that, uh, th that executed its first program, 16th of November 1953, and was, we all went to have a drink, and it was all a great exciting day. Um, the the full-scale machine in 1955, um, or I should say that prototype had 92-point contact transistors. Incredible economy uh, with, with this, these transistors. We'd be single state, uh, single uh, transistor, two state device, amplifier, all in one, and a few diodes thrown in for the logical operations. So we had an automatic multiplier on the full scale machine, 1955, eight index registers, a double length accumulator register, 88 bits, an E register which was just used for shifting the timing. 250, 250 point contact transistors, um, 1400 odd point contact transistors, consumed 150 watts of power. In retrospect, I could have got the power down but by uh, re re reducing the, uh, um, the 50 volt power supplies. Um, I had a great belief in, in current feeds so I thought, good idea to have nice high voltages, and these 50 volt power supplies happened to be available. They, they were a kind of saturable transformer device. It was very difficult to get stabilized power supplies in those, day, those low voltages. So for the 12 volt line, uh, I, I used uh, lead acid accumulators. Uh, uh, quite big 2 volt lead acid accumulators, like the ones that people used to cart with their radios uh, in, in the 30s. Um, I, I um, ha had some colleagues to help me. One uh, particular colleague was, was Doug Webb, a uh, Canadian. He, he's now on the, uh, um, the, the East Coast uh, working on submersible uh, vehicles for ocean currents. Uh, he, he was a great character, um, a great inspiration when, when things looked black and all the transistors were failing right, left. Um, uh, he was a Bugatti enthusiast, uh, and um, the, the Bugatti was an incredible car, and, and one of the features of it was that it had four valves and, and the cylinder head, and wafer-thin uh, connections of metal between these valves. So he, he was very skilled. He, he um, ground the valves on, on this uh, car, so, so he was very, very skilled. So he, he actually um, constructed uh, in the workshop, the regenerative tracks. Uh, and uh, the problem was how to adjust the spacing between the heads. So he had a sheet of steel uh, about um, 16 of an inch thick, and he cut slits in it and put screws in. Uh, the slits didn't go all the way through, so by adjusting the screws, he actually bent the opening of the slits to make this small adjustment. Um, did I say that the, the heads had to be very close to the, the drum? Uh, and uh, the, the, the heads were, the main, most of the heads were for anti heads, <coughs> and they had a screw adjustment. And to 
get them at the right distance, you had a little screwdriver type thing, you wound them in until you had a little ping, and that means the head had touched the drum, and you wound it out just a shade until it no longer pinged. Um, the, the nickel was very robust. You couldn't do it with a magnet dioxide. Um, but um, there was a problem with, with the drum, which um, could have got corrected, I suppose, if we had a bit more money and Franti had been a bit more uh, willing and so on. Uh, over part of the drum, there was a hairline crack going down vertically. So that, that was quite useless for regenerative tracks because every time it went round, you lost a bit because of the, the hairline crack. So let's have a look at the machine. H here we are. Here's the, here's the machine. It was done with so -called, built on so-called post office racks, um, probably specified by the British Post Office, the GPO. 19-inch spacing. Uh, you'll see these tag strips a bit uh, better. I had these made specially. Um, um, post office key switches for, for the input uh, and uh, the, the output was uh, some um, tuning indicator tubes, lo low voltage tuning indicator tubes. Here's the drum. Uh, here you see the surface of, of the, uh, the wheel. It's gantry uh, and um, uh, he he here some heads here, very difficult to see there. Um, I had to make my own oscilloscope at one time even. Uh, well, I adopted one, um, but uh, eventually got one from Ferranti. So there's a huge thing that had to be lugged around. Here, here you see the regenerative tracks uh, and, and uh, a main track block on, on, on the wheel. Uh, and this thing was flying around at 90 miles an hour surface, and there was this terrifying experience of adjusting the heads. I used to do this at night too, and I thought, well, if the thing explodes, there'd be no one to, to pick up the bits of me. <laughs> uh, getting a bit closer, and a bit closer still. Um, here we have here one of the transistors, uh, half watt resistors, uh, the germanium diodes, another resistor. Um, th th that's a uh, Mullard transistor, an OC51. Uh, Mullard's used a coding system, so the EF50, the E stood for 6 volts, and, and the 0 uh, here um, or, uh, stood for 0 volts, so it had a 0 volt heater. Um, all, all done by hand. Um, it was a, 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 a technician, a rather elderly technician, who, bless him, he did his, he did his best, but he was awfully slow. Um, but we, we managed. And I had a, a couple of apprentices from the, the, the then Metrovic company. Um, that They came, so Willis Jackson, director of research, um, heard about this machine, and one or two people at Metrovic thought they ought to get into computers. So Ferranti had already were already well established, so um, they came along to see, see, to see me. They worked with me, and they decided to make uh, my machine. And uh, they they made a better job of it than I did. Of course, they had the printed circuit technology. It's the underside of the board, and the the the, the upper side board uh, here, the transistors, uh, uh, and. Um, we, we used transformers to uh, carry the, the clock waveform around the machine, uh, little ferox, ferox cube transformers. So it was trans transferred at high voltage and then stepped down to the right value. Um, here was the, uh, the drum, a bit, bit similar to this juice drum. Um, and at the, the top, the regenerative tracks, Made, made, made a good job of this. And, and um, at, um, let's go to the next. Here, here's the complete machine, the Metrovic 950. Uh, they, they later converted it to junction transistors that became available. But again, it was a straight copy. They more or less replaced the point contact transistors with two junctions. Uh, nice uh, control panel here um, to take reader and take punch. 
And uh, they, they made six of these machines, but they never sold any outside the company. But they used them for engineering calculations uh, through, throughout uh, uh, the machine. Um, so th that was the transistor computer. Um, I, I started to turn to other things then, and I want to like to include one or two other things. Um, we, we, we had a salesman that came round um, from, um, dare I say it, Mullard's. Um, and uh, I, I said, well, can't you test these junction transistors for speed? And he said, it's response. Um, so I had to do the selection. And uh, th they were very much slower than the point contact. Uh, a 20, 50, k 50 kilohertz clock rate was probably uh, the best you could get out of, of most of them. Anyway, I made a small, small core store uh, with, with these, uh, using these junction transistors. Tiny experimental one, uh, only 16 cores, but uh, um, it, it, was, uh, it was quite fun to, to make, and uh, it used up quite a lot of, lot of, a lot of circuits, and, and, and that worked quite nicely. And then the, the, the last thing I, I'd like to talk about, moving ahead a bit, but still, I, still I suppose related to transistors. Transistors got better, um, uh, and um, we, we, we could uh, uh, use a variety of techniques like emit a couple logic in, in certain of the circuits. So um, with, with the Atlas uh, computer, um, Tom, Tom proposed that we should have a read-only memory. And uh, this was a the so-called fixed store, and it worked on a trans, uh, transformer principle. Um, there was a, a, a ferrite rod which could be placed uh, between these two windings or not, as the case would be. If you wanted a one, you put a ferrite rod there. If you didn't, no. Uh, and you had a primary winding and a secondary winding. Now, to realize this, um, we made use of a woven wire mesh. Uh, Lancash uh, Lancashire, being the cotton industry, were well versed to uh, weaving, um, uh, had wire weavers as well. And, and this was woven with uh, a Lumex wire, which is enameled copper wire, where the uh, enamel could be removed by soldering, heat with the soldering, so it's very convenient. So we, we had this woven wire mesh made. Uh, the size of these ferrite rods uh, was about the size of a, a propelling pencil lead and about uh, um, three-eighths of an inch long. And um, we, we realized we could get a better signal by having return paths. So we had the so-called keeper rods, like the keeper of a, of a horseshoe magnet. Uh, but of course, there was a, a considerable air circuit as well. So we, we, we hoped that the flux would hopefully return down these adjacent keeper rods. Uh, and then Tom had the bright idea to improve the ratio between ones and zeros to put copper rods in for zeros, and um, uh, the um, ferrite rods in for ones. Uh, and he, here's the uh, prototype version. Uh, and this, fortunately, still exists in the computer department at Manchester University. Um, this is about five foot high. Um, uh, there were 52 bits uh, across, um, and 8,000 8, words are, are of uh, 8,000 words, 52-bit words. Uh, th this was, uh, uh, s s there was selection on the right uh, waveforms, right uh, circuits here. I, I think eight-way selection here, and also a similar selection on the, on the, um, on, on, on the, on the uh, sorry, the right circuits are up here. We drove the pulse all the way down uh, the, the top and all the way up the back, from the top right round to the back. And they, these were terminated transmission lines. Hairpin loops here with a read selection here. Uh, and um, we, we, um, we, we wanted to use a jig to insert these uh, ferrite rods to have them all installed and then removed according to ones that weren't needed. Uh, it was, they were suitably painted. Uh, but 
in order to use the jig, this, the accuracy of the weaving had to be very good. And we got lots of these samples back, and always there was some bad spacing somewhere. So Tom said, go to Warrington Dick, sort it out. So off I went and, and said, well, look, and, you know, these sort of fairly burly sort of men working these horrible machines. They, so what's this sort of work coming from university? What's he want this bit of wire for? What is this wire mesh for? They, they've been using it for big industrial machines. And I said, anyway, I talked them into it and said, well, look, there's a problem here. Uh, this is no good. Um, there's this spacing. And they said, they looked at it. He said, oh, that's when we had our tea break. Um, so we, we, um, we got it done all right, and then we, we had uh, um, t two young ladies from uh, Ferranti, and they spent five weeks putting these ferrite rods into the, this thing. They nearly went blind in the process. And I thought, no one's going <laughs> to no thank them, so I, I bought them a bo box of chocolates. <laughs> so that, that uh, thank you, is the end of the, the tale. Mm. So any, any questions? Uh, sure, sure yes, any questions? questions? Yes, great. The, yeah. Yes, Steve. How expensive were the transistors compared to the uh, Well, if you might just repeat yeah. the question. Uh, yeah, how, how expensive were the, the tw transistors relative to the valves? Um, I, I don't, didn't really know. Um, I, I um, sorry, there'll be a, a few sort of anecdotes here as well. Now. Um, I, I was about to be. Uh, called up for military service uh, and F.C. Williams uh, went, went to a meeting and they said they've got no one in the country working on transistors and F.C. said, well I have, but he's about to be called up. He says, stop it, stop him. And so they immediately gave me a contract with the so-called Ministry, uh, Ministry of Supply uh, and uh, that uh, ran the radar is telecommunications research assistant at Malvern, TRE, and I had a contract with them and, and, and they, they just bought things for me. But I, I, I don't know whether, what price they would have be, but um, they're probably about five pounds a time, and um, I always multiply by 40 to convert currency. So, um, but we, we didn't, I, I, I had, I think I had about 90% of the output of, of the factory. I was very privileged, so. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure. But everything came. I, I just wrote a requisition. It all came. It was wonderful. I don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> <laughs> no research. I mean, we got the research grant and it was all done behind the scenes. No worry. So we just got on with the job. I, 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 um, I was appointed to the teaching staff in 51 uh, and um, uh, the department was started, electrotechnics department originally started about 1895 and to sort of judge the size of the department, it started to expand at the time they appointed me. They appointed three people with me, uh, and uh, I was the number 17 on the staff to be 17 to be appointed in the history of the department. So it's very small. Yes. When you came and powered it up in the morning, can you tell us about? I think it just didn't. Yeah. Up. Well, typically two transistors didn't work; they were stuck on. Uh, and uh, you spent, um, I, I tended to work 10 to 10, so it, typically till midday, um, spent about a couple of hours finding the ones that were stuck. And um, this was, uh, didn't turn off, so uh, you had to increase the base current, uh, so you soldered on a parallel resistor, and so it <laughs> sort of grew Christ Christmas tree-like with all these various resistors. Eventually we had to purge and replace them with an appropriate value, but um, uh, this was the, the, the sad part about it. That, uh, mind you, the, the Mark I had a mean time to, between failures of about half an hour. Um, mm. uh, yes, I've been led to believe that the index register was uh, invented by at University of Manchester. I think so, yes. It was the B, the B register. Yeah, and th that was in the, the uh, uh, Manchester Mark I had, had a B register. 
um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, that, that's that's for sure. Yeah, paging also invented. Um, that those are some big inventions. Yeah, well, we had it. We had an accumulator register, the B register. Sorry, accumulator register, control register, multiplier registers. So we had to be called something. So it's called B. Any questions? Um, it, it had some um, uh, what we call it BIOS, I suppose, nowadays. It, it had um, a, a, a base, uh, a basic sort of um, bootstrapping program, and then it had a number of subroutines in it, useful subroutines. Uh, can I tell something else? Um, on, going back to the the, the, the Mark One. Um, Turing wrote a programming manual for, for, for the Mark I, and uh, he, he coded up a program for the exponential function. And no one, he used seven instructions, this exponential function, and no one could understand how it could work. Uh, and I used to get all the, all the, the mugs game thing, you know, and I got the short straw. So I was chosen to go and ask Turing how this worked, and knocked on his door very timidly. And he, was, he was a very nice man, but everyone was very sort of frightened of him because he had this sort of barrier. And, uh, and I thought that, you know, I thought it would be absolutely stupid asking, asking this question. And he said, oh, it's very simple, and I think it was just a simple power series expansion. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we get that, but where do you get the one from? Oh, I changed the sign convention from plus to plus minus uh, to, to, to get the, the one in. So everything had to be very, very e economical. Dick, you talked in the car with me about yeah. uh, your discussion with Alan Turing and, yeah. and Tom Kilburn. Yeah. What do they like as people to interact um, and deal with? Can you share, share some comments with us? Tom was very, very rever reserved, very quiet, a man of very few words. Um, he's, we had a 50th anniversary recently, and his secretary was there. And she said, Tom has spoken to me more in this last half an hour than he did in sort of 20 years or so. <laughs> he used to, used to come in the morning, open the mail, said, Di, Tommy Thomas, Dick, and, and deal with the mail that way. And, and, and then he went back. And then with, with the Atlas, he had a, an old aircraft seat, which sort of laid back. He used to s sit there puffing his pipe. And somehow the, the fumes of the pipe sort of got into us, and we understood what we had to do. But he, he didn't really say much. Um, Turing was um, Turing was was very strange. He he sometimes didn't didn't see you really, walk past you, and he was obviously thinking up something by himself. He he didn't make actually much contribution to the the, the Mark One, and there was a this sort of feud that went in went on between the engineers and the mathematicians all the time. Each blamed the other for the, the faults. Um, and um, Turing perpetuated the coding of the Mark I. Uh, and that used, uh, it was assembly language, well, not assembly language, it was binary coding, but not binary, it was on a scale of 32. So we used a teleprinter code, a stroke yat a colon s i u r half, so on, for the digits 0 to 31. And I said to Turing one day, he says, no, it's, it's very difficult this, and how can you, how can I cope with these uh, writing instructions like stroke ET stroke? And I said, I can't even learn the, the alphabet of the thing. He said, oh, it's very easy. You just write on a bit of paper, put on your bicycle handlebar, and you learn it as you cycle to work. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I did this. And of course, the, the famous story of his bicycle, which you must have heard, um, the, the tr he, he was a great sort of athlete. Sometimes he used to run in 12 miles from where he lived. And uh, other times he came on this very decrepit bicycle. He, he was quite wealthy, you know, he could have had a car or anything, but he was quite wealthy, but he had this real decrepit bicycle, and the chain would come off. And he, he worked out that every, I don't, don't tell me what, how, this, how he did this and what the mathematics of this was, but apparently every 27, 27 and a half revolutions, the, train, the, the uh, chain would, would, would come off. So he, he counted as he was thinking of various things, so take the pressure off every 27 and a half pedal 
rev revolutions. And, uh, it was uh, quite an interesting character. Any other questions? Acoustic delay lines, acoustic delay lines, which were developed in Manchester, I guess. Um, yes, we 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 did we didn't very do very much with acoustic delay lines. Um, the the um, uh, a colleague of uh, some colleagues of mine in the next room, Barry Chaplin, Roy Hayes, uh, and Alwyn Owens, were, were working on a uh, magnet restricted delay line. Can we can you pass it over, John? That one, the far one. Um, um, uh, and that that was a uh, yeah yeah that that, that was um, that's a magnetostrictive delay line store. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's the that's another acoustic one. Um, the the uh, that that was the the magnetostrictive one. Sorry, was was a, was a contender for for, for memory. Um, but uh, it didn't seem to have any great advantage because it was a, certainly a delay line uh, and of course the access time with the delay lines was the problem. Um, they, they were used in the, the, Ed, the, the Cambridge, uh, the EDSAC used Mercury delay lines, the ACE, and that's an ACE Mercury delay line, uh, they, they, they used uh, acoustic delay lines. Uh, but we, we had the Williams tube for the, uh, at, at least, uh, uh, which was random access, which was you know, very much faster. So great. So use that for most everything. That was used. That was used uh, in, in the, the Mark One and um, the the Mercury computer. I mean, Mercury had nothing to do with Mercury delay lines. Any other questions? Dick, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And and we have just a, a oh. very, very small token oh. of appreciation for thank you, your, thank you, thank uh, and for, for a wonderful thank lecture. Yeah, thank you very and much. And we're all going to be over in uh, Building 126. You're all welcome to come and join us for a reception. Yeah. And Dick will be over there yeah. and he'll be here for a few minutes. Okay, thank you.